Oh, Canada, we stay at home for thee. Hello, everybody. I'm Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director and co-head at TIFF, and I want to welcome you all to Stay at Home Cinema. Uh, this is our connection, our, our way to try to connect people all across Canada and around the world if we can, watch a movie together, share our reactions. And before we do that, we always check in with a guest from the film. So we're gonna do that tonight with the film by Ang Lee called Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, this is happening on Crave across Canada. And if you're not in Canada, just find Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon wherever you can. Uh, shout outs before we begin. I wanna shout out all indigenous storytellers coast to coast to coast across Canada. All the people and organizations who make everything we do possible. Our lead sponsor, Bell. Our major sponsors, RBC. L'Oreal Paris and Visa, they help keep us going, as do all of the donors and members of TIFF that may be you out there. And a big shout out tonight across Canada to the government. Government of Canada, the provincial government, the government of Toronto, the city municipal government here, all are working so hard. Shout out especially to all the government workers who are helping to keep the city going, keep the country going, uh, and help keep Canadians uh, with some money in their pockets as well. So thank you to all of them. Um, and I also just want to thank all of you for being here tonight. So in a little bit, we're going to have the screenwriter from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, uh, Mr. James Seamus. Uh, before that, just a little bit about the film. You'll remember earlier this year, it feels like a lifetime ago, but earlier this year, Parasite won the Oscar for Best Picture along with some other Oscars, a film from South Korea by Bong Joon-ho. Last year, the film everybody was talking about, one of them was Roma uh, by Alfonso Cuaron, Mexican film in the Spanish language. Those are becoming more and more of a, of a regular thing now in North America. But there was a time when North Americans, Canadians, Americans did not watch a lot of what we call foreign language films, films not in the English or French language. And, um, and that's changing. And one of the reasons it changed is Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It goes back 20 years now. But that was, at the time, the highest grossing foreign language film in North America ever. Uh, it won a whole lot of Oscars along with many other awards. It really broke uh, Chinese cinema into the rest of the world in a bigger way beyond the, the sort of the hardcore fans who were familiar with it before. And it's all down to director Ang Lee, uh, screenwriter James Seamus, and the whole team that put that movie together. Uh, we want to bring James in now, so I'm going to see if I can uh, if I can get him on the line. Uh, let me see. All right, and I think I... we're waiting for him to connect. Uh, I got some questions here, and if you have questions, just post them as well. If I can can get to some of them, I definitely will. Uh, we're just waiting to connect right now with James, who I believe is in New York or might be in Los Angeles. He is. Um, still very busy in the film industry. He used to run Focus Features, one of the top independent film producers and distributors uh, in uh, the U.S. Uh, produced a lot of Ang Lee's films and, um, and wrote uh, a number of them alongside Ang Lee and other screenwriters as well. Uh, we want to hear what he has to say about the making of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, since right now we're still waiting for him to connect. Uh, so I hope we will see him soon. Oh, okay. I see. I see you've given me a message, James. Hello, uh, but I'm not seeing you on the video. <laughs> James, can you connect the video? Let me try it again. All right, I'm trying to add you now. There we go, Mr. James Seamus. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Welcome to Stay at Home Cinema. <laughs> Hello. Give me one second. I'm just going to, I set up a whole system here, and I think this should work now. All right. All right. right. We can see you. We can hear you. Where are we finding you tonight? You are finding me in upstate New York in the land of very slow internet. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hope this works, uh, but I've got a good signal here. I hope people can see and hear you. Um, I want to start by asking you just about how Crouching Tiger became the phenomenon that it was. It premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2000, played our festival in Toronto and many, many others, went on to gross over two 
hundred million dollars at the global box office, won over a hundred awards, including four Oscars. When you were working on the screenplay, were you writing a blockbuster? Was that in your mind at the time? <laughs> you, you, you always wish, but no, of course not. Um, and first off, I'd just like to say hello, Canada. It was lovely to hear your introduction, uh, Cameron. Uh, I wish we could say the same about our leadership uh, south of 48, but uh, we're very envious. And if anybody wants to sponsor me, you know, <laughs> I'm ready to As soon as the um, borders reopen, you're welcome, James. Thank you so much. Um, uh, but it's a real pleasure to join you tonight. So, no, you know, look, at the time, the genre of the Chopsaki movie uh, had fallen into somewhat disrepute and disrepair. And so there wasn't a lot of circulation even regionally for the more Hong Kong style, you know, fist uh, kind of approach, let alone uh, the more, uh, shall we say, elegant uh, wuxia style, right? The kind that we associate with King Hu and other great filmmakers, the kind of more the, the floating, the leg, the, the flying, all that kind of stuff, the mm -hmm. wire work. Um, and so when we went out to try to put the uh, financing for the film together, uh, originally, it was we were met with some fairly cold sh shoulders, um, but we were dedicated. We had a great team, in particular Bill Kong, uh, our producer in Hong Kong, who was uh, fearless. And we actually had a legend. Uh, I don't know if people, if, the, if you don't follow Bill Kong's uh, producer, uh, a remarkable executive working in film for for decades, and was very instrumental here. He was, and uh, and and he's and, and for being maybe the most successful producer in the world kind of, when you think about what he's done. Uh, he's a very humble person too, he's a very modest person. Um, we ended up finding a billionaire to uh, finance the movie. It, was, uh, it wasn't a huge budget uh, by any means, uh, but it was certainly larger than a lot of uh, films that were being produced at that time in the region. Uh, and uh, he was great, except for one thing, we started pre-production and um, he lost our phone number and wasn't picking up his phone number. <laughs> And that started two months of, uh, of sleeplessness and uh, a scramble for funds for the film that probably ended up becoming the single most complex financing I've ever been a part of. Mm. Um, we, I believe we had a French bank, we had a British Virgin Islands subsidiary of a Hong Kong company uh, with a California bond uh, in, insurer we had a circular finance agreement with, I believe, six different international distributors. Uh, plus, I'm not even sure what that means, but it sounds very complicated. Everybody promised that they would pay us. They just wouldn't pay us then, so we had to take their contracts and bank them uh, with the bank in Paris, but for a discount. And then the good folks at Sony Classics stepped in, as well as at Columbia Pictures, which was owned by Sony and still is uh, at that time. They had just started uh, a division to support Asian cinema. And that team came in also and picked up multiple territories. So at the end of the day, in order to close the financing and about, we had about six weeks and uh, to do it, I think there were over 20 signatures on the final contract, 20 different wow. entities. So at that point, I didn't really care if it was a blockbuster or, <laughs> or, or a pre- Just wanted to get it made. Yeah, exactly. Or a webisode. It was just like, whatever. Um, you know, you mentioned Wuxia before, and some people will know that, that genre of film very well, some will not. Um, but there, at the time, there was a very hardcore devoted audience um, across Asia and in, in many parts of the West as well, but it wasn't the, the popular Hollywood audience for these very elegant martial arts films that were kind of fantasies in a way, because uh, the, the fighters in them could do things that no human being could do. They could almost fly in many cases. Um, in telling a wuxia story for a global audience, what elements of that genre did you want to keep and what did you want to make uh, change or make fresh? Well, you know, my own role in this was to play the kind of holy fool to Aang and to the team in China. Uh, the film is based on one, one of five volumes of a series uh, uh, by a, a wonderful kind of pop Chinese writer uh, from earlier in the uh, 20th century, uh, Wang Du. And so, um, uh, had never been translated into English. So the first thing that had to happen for me to be able to help participate in crafting it was for a synopsis of that volume uh, to be written up, just condensing it. Of course, the synopsis was longer than War and Peace. I mean, it was <laughs> and it had elements, there were story elements and, uh, uh, that we, we knew we wanted to keep. And uh, among them was 
the kind of nobility of a, a, of a kind of freelance warrior class, we know this by analogy with, with Westerns, for example. We know it by analogy with samurai films. But in the Chinese context, of course, there is a whole other literary and philosophical and political tradition uh, that attaches itself to those figures. We also really wanted to mine the kind of revolutionary, we, we felt, uh, promise of the fact that this particular volume centered on women and women characters who often are relegated to secondary status, both in the tradition as well as in its imaginings, its more contemporary imaginings. And so um, the combination of both the strong tradition as well as this uh, opening to a kind of very modern and new sensibility that tests that tradition was really crucial to us uh, as we developed the, the, the film. You mentioned uh, women being at the center of this film, and that's, I think, one of the most powerful, most exciting things about watching uh, the film unfold is to see what Michelle Yeoh and Zhang Ziyi do alongside Chow Yun-Fat and the other characters, the other actors. Can you talk a little bit about casting this movie and the particular qualities that you needed from each one of these stars? Yeah, I mean, uh, the casting was pretty obvious in a sense, <laughs> at least retrospectively. Although at the time, Aang was really taking a risk. Um, Chow Yun-Fat, uh, of course, from Hong Kong, doesn't speak Mandarin as a native language. Uh, Michelle Yeoh, the same thing. So she's so Malaysian. Were, she's Malaysian. So, um, so they're speaking at times phonetically. And um, Aang truly believed that he, it was worth taking the risk with a kind of pan-Chinese cast and crew to bring a, a, uni a measure of unity to all these disparate strands, both linguistic as well as cultural and historical. Uh, John Dee was a whole other <laughs> process. Uh, and one, uh, I mean, th th resulted in her casting, but that process was an enormous dragnet, you might say, that uh, led Aang to consider hundreds, if not thousands of uh, folks who were uh, trying out for that part. So as, so, had, as I understand, Zhang Zi had just done one, one Zhang Yimou film, The Road Home, at that point. Exactly. She wasn't the megastar that she became. Not at all. But she had something that a lot of other folks uh, who were uh, uh, up for the part, I think we all know, ha didn't have. And that was a, a, a training in classical Chinese dance um, and a, a, the ability to really pick up the martial arts uh, very, very quickly. She was just as an incredible, uh, just such an incredible talent. Yeah, she really is. And so you mentioned the just the, the wuxia and the, the training that's necessary to be able to even be able to do some of those stunt scenes. Um, I want to ask you about uh, Yuan Woping, who uh, I think a lot of people in the West first heard about when he was the uh, martial arts coordinator on The Matrix. And this came right after The Matrix, if I'm not mistaken. But he had already a long career in Hong Kong. Can you talk a little bit about what he brought to just that beautiful, balletic sense of, of battle uh, in Crouching Tiger? Well, he, he, honestly, he's the master. So, um, and yet, uh, the, the master, especially in the role of fight choreographer, in the cinema that he would help found, in a sense, uh, has a very specific role on those sets, which is not the role that Ang Lee envisioned <laughs> for him. That's in most of the films that are directed by director A, but have Wen Wo Ping doing the stunts and the fight choreography, he just does those and just slots them into the movie. Mm -hmm. it's, it's his domain. So the first few weeks of that relationship, I have to say was pretty epic uh, as two masters in a sense, and I, I, I think I, it's not tales out of school, there, there, were genuine, there was genuine conflict, there was genuine stress, and then it developed into one of the most beautiful love stories ever I've ever seen unfold on set. A partnership uh, as I've never seen unless you really see with a director and an actor, for example. And, uh, but it was, it was really interesting to see that clash of culture and vision and then see how the two of them worked it out. And, huh. and in, in particular because uh, Wen Wuping was working in a kind of hybrid form, the Hong Kong form, and Aang was really wanting to go back to, not back, but also beyond, the, to a new uh, approach to especially the wire work. Um, mm -hmm. We were working at a time, this is 20 years ago, when digital post-production was not really a thing yet. It, it was just starting to be something where you could use a digital, inter, what we now talk, say is a digital intermediate. Um, but we were only using it really for the wire removal. 
So that allowed us to do things that King Hu and others hadn't been able to do because they would have to try to uh, optically remove the wires or shoot mm -hmm. in such a way that the wires were not visible. And so we ended up with, uh, I think, around 600 shots that were, we, were, we were painting out the wires. Uh, that created an enormous opportunity for new kinds of, 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 uh, of stunts and, and choreography. Hmm. I should say that the question about uh, Yuan Wo Ping came from one of our members, a TIFF member, forgot to mention this, uh, Nomfan Alo Malloy on Twitter asked that question. Um, I want to ask you about all of the work you did with Ang Lee, uh, many, many films as producer and screenwriter, including Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, Sense and Sensibility, The Ice Storm, Crouching Tiger, Hulk, the underrated Hulk, I will say, Brokeback Mountain and, and Lust Caution, such a wide variety of films. And that's what Ang was really known for. And you were with him along the way on all of those movies. Um, what was it, how, first of all, how did you uh, two first connect? And what was it that kept you connected over all those films? Oh, well, I think the one thing that kept us connected is the thing that still keeps us connected as friends. And that's we're kind of just, life is film school. We, we love to learn new things, new cultures, new ideas and also new challenges. And I think that uh, rather than rehash a kind of skill set that we developed over time and pretend that we're the pros, we like to be the amateurs. We like mm. to be the newcomers. And I think to this day that animates Aang's work. And I think that's what keeps it so much fun. I got to meet Aang right in the early days of the New York independent film scene when I was a partner with a guy named Ted Hope in a little company we founded called Good Machine. And he's like, now at a big yeah. company called Amazon. <laughs> yeah, he was now running Helping Run Production, a little, just a little joint called Amazon. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, uh, Ted loved making lists. That was his favorite thing. And he made a list of the 10 filmmakers who made great short films at film school and got their MFA degrees, but had not yet made features. And on that list was a guy named Ang Lee, who had gone to NYU and made a lovely film called Fine Line, uh, which I watched on a VHS videotape. <laughs> uh, but that had been six years prior to Ted and me getting together, and we actually called Ang's agent at the time, who's actually a wonderful person, um, and said, hey, we're really interested in this guy, Ang Lee. And she said, well, that's great, but you guys have this little tiny company that you, 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 know, you say you do no-budget films. He's got a development deal at Universal. He's working on a film with Giancarlo Giannini. He's, you know, he's the, I, this is not, we said, that's okay. We just, you know, if he's ever, interested, whatever. And honestly, two weeks later, Ang called us out of the blue and said, I just won a screenplay award in Taiwan from Central Motion Picture. It comes with a few hundred thousand dollars. By few, I mean very few. And people say that you guys can make movies for, you know, no money. Uh, would you mind talking to me? And, and he had no idea we had called his agent. It was completely wow. serendipitous. We got to sit with Ang for about 45 minutes, uh, almost an hour. Uh, he came to our office, which was uh, next to the World Trade Center on Warren Street above a strip joint. And, um, and he pitched what became his first film, uh, Pushing Hands. Um, and by pitch, I mean for 45 minutes, he droned on explaining every scene. <laughs> and it was, it was my, I honestly, and I'm not making this up, I actually saw Ted start to nod off. <laughs> 35 minutes later, it was like, it's the beginning of a beautiful relationship. It was. And it was because I, afterwards, both Ted and I said, you know, he's Ang Lee is obviously the worst, world's worst pitcher. Uh, <laughs> he's not a used car salesman. But we, we both realized that he described the movie that in his head already. He knew he was so prepared already. Uh, and we had a blast making that first film, then went right into making uh, The Wedding Banquet. Right. Amazing. Um, I've got a question here from another TIFF member, Ben White who uh, wants to know, as a producer, what's the biggest challenge you've faced and how did you overcome it? The biggest challenge I've ever faced as a producer is actually a film that we completed this past year uh, and will be, this is my, I get to plug, um, will be available on DVD and uh, streaming uh, in a couple of weeks. It's called The Assistant. It stars the amazing Julia Garner, directed by a brilliant young woman named Kitty Green. It's a film that takes place in one day in a, the office of a motion picture uh, company that may remind some people, mm -hmm. I don't know why, of uh, the office of a guy by the name of Harvey Weinstein. Um, we started to put the film together. I think it's a masterpiece. Um, and, uh, but at the time, as we put the film together and tried to get the financing, it, uh, we realized that pretty much the entire business, not just Harvey Weinstein and his friends, but everybody in the business did not want to see this movie and mm -hmm. see it made. And so we had our, our financing blown up. We had people threatening us. 
it was it was mind boggling, honestly. And you realized that the problem was not Harvey Weinstein. The problem was us. It was all of us. It's the whole business. It's the industry from festivals to production companies to distributors. There wasn't any place that was ready to step up. We finished the film. Uh, we took it to Telluride. We ended up going to Sundance. Obviously, it's a it's an amazing movie. It's I think it's 90 percent Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. But even then, we realized that there were there was a chatter among the business that was saying, don't buy this movie. And we finally found a, a distributor who was apparently not rapey and uh, wonderfully supportive in Bleecker Street is my old partner from Focus Features, as a matter of fact. And uh, they were brave enough to put the film out there, uh, brave enough to stand down from some of the threats I mean, phone calls from lawyers and things like that uh, and get the film out there. So we're very proud of it. Uh, but from beginning to end, I would say it was, it was a joy challenge. to make, but there, was, uh, there, was a, there, was, there were wins against us every step of the way. It's good that after all of these decades of making movies, James, that you're still taking chances, still finding talented uh, young filmmakers to work with. It's really fun. Uh, I want to wrap it up by asking you, but Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, in the context of right now. Um, this was a movie made by Chinese and American artists and craftspeople from many different countries, from New York, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Beijing, Taiwan, and beyond. When you think of a movie, uh, think of this movie in today's context of a virus that's reminded us of how interconnected we all are, does it have new resonance for you? It really does, and I, I'll, I'll tell you, and I, by the way, I'm, uh, I, I, I probably won't be able to join you for the live tweeting in the movie. I'm still recovering myself from COVID, so, but I'm oh. on the other side. How are you Thank feeling, you, you all right? right? Yep, I really am. A little worse right. for wear, though. I, don't, wouldn't wish, I had a very mild case, but uh, I wouldn't even wish mild on people, but I'm very blessed, super Good. blessed. But it does make me realize that uh, the residue of our activity, that is our activity moves us all over the globe. And we're restless people in this business, as you, you well know, uh, at TIFF, because the world comes to you, but you have, you have to do a lot to bring them yeah. um, and, and welcome them. Um, but then we leave a trace, and that trace is our movies. Um, and that trace is the friendships we make across boundaries and borders and languages and cultures. And uh, it's such a privilege. We really are blessed to be able to uh, both have those experiences but also leave a material trace that is a work of art or, or, or even just a work of entertainment. It doesn't matter what you call it. Um, and something that can remain circulating and continue to have its relevance, even virtually, digitally, however. Um, we'll get through this, I'm sure. We're all, you know, I, I, as I told my kids, uh, I actually remember in my American history textbook, the paragraph that was relegated in that book to an account of the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic. And I realize when I say one paragraph. Yeah, 50 million people died, unbelievable. Yeah, and, I, and, and we are now living one paragraph in a history book right now. We'll get through this. It's like, this <laughs> we will get through it. This is a paragraph. And, and our brothers and sisters in places like Palestine or in Soweto or elsewhere who are really, you know, where there's really the, the forces and powers that are using this crisis against them to consolidate uh, their powers, we, we, we should be mindful. There's going to be enormous pain amongst us all. We're all going to share that too. But there are those uh, out there who are going to have even their, a larger share of that pain. And it's going to be our responsibility when the, this fog lifts to continue to, uh, to fight to get their voices heard. And to, uh, and, and to reach out to them and make sure that the traces of those relationships also find their way as they will, I know, to TIFF mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Thank you. James Seamus, thank you so much for taking the time to join us to introduce Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. We're gonna start it at 7.30 Eastern time, 4.30 on the West Coast, uh, in Canada, across uh, the country on Crave. But if you're not in Canada, find it wherever you can. It's a terrific movie. I'm gonna sit down and watch it with my family. James, thanks again so much. And, well, thank uh, you so much for having me and, and for sharing the film. It's really oh, a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.